So we are in week two of our summer sermon series, The Prostitute in the Family Tree. Now, Larry and I chose this sermon series for the summer for two reasons. The first is because we wanted to have a little bit of fun during the summer with the sermons. And two, because we really both agree with what the author Douglas Adams says, that God has a sense of humor, and that a lot of the humor and irony that's in the Bible gets sort of brushed aside and ignored when we read it and preach on it. So we're looking at it this summer. So last week, we had a little bit of fun with the genealogy of Jesus, and then Larry pointed out that as we read through the Bible, we can see that families have been putting the fun in dysfunctional since the beginning of time. <laughs> so this week, we get to look at families a little bit more as we look at the chapter that Douglas Adams titles Fractured Families and Busted Banquets. Now, before we do that, I want to remind you of the difference between parent stories and grandparent stories. Remember, parent stories are those pretty glossy stories the ones where the family looks really good, there's no mistakes, it's all really pretty and perfect. And grandparent stories on the other side, well, they're a little bit more honest. They show a little bit of those rough edges. You know, some of those ugly truths that we would really prefer our kids and other people didn't know about us. So Douglas Adams points out that if Jesus told parent stories, the parables would be full of Beautiful, perfect families, really nice, fun parties, fair, just people, they'd be really polished. But Jesus doesn't tell parent stories, Jesus tells grandparent stories. Jesus' parables are a little rough around the edges. They show people's flaws and imperfections, and sort of show some of those ugly truths, and maybe we don't always want to look at. So the fractured family that Douglas Adams has us look at this morning um, is from a parable that's been preached on thousands and thousands and thousands of times. We think of it as the prodigal son. He calls it the prodigal family. Because he claims they're all a little rough around the edges. And this is in Luke 15. Once a man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Give me my share of the property. So the father divided his property between his two sons. Not long after that, the younger son packed up everything he owned and left for a foreign country, where he wasted all his money in wild living. He spent everything when a bad famine spread through the whole land and soon had nothing to eat. He went to work for a man in that country, and the man sent him out to take care of his pigs. He would have been glad to eat what the pigs were eating, but no one gave him a thing. Finally, he came to his senses and said, My father's workers have plenty to eat, and here I am starving to death. I'll go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against God in heaven and against you. I'm no longer good enough to be called your son. Treat me like one of your workers. The younger son got up and started back to his father. But when he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt sorry for him, and ran to his son and hugged and kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against God in heaven and against you. I am no longer good enough to be called your son. But his father said to the servants, Hurry and bring the best clothes and put them on him. Give him a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Get the best calf and prepare it so he can, we can eat and celebrate. This son of mine was dead, but now he's come back to life. He was lost, but has now been found. And they began to celebrate. The older son had been out in the field, but when he came near the house, he heard the music and the dancing. So he called one of the servants over and asked, What's going on here? The servant answered, Your brothers come home safe and sound, and your father ordered us to kill the best calf. The older brother got so angry that he would not even go into the house. His father came out and begged him to go in, but he said to his father, For years I've worked for you like a slave and have always obeyed you, but you've never even given me a little goat so that I could have dinner with my friends. 
This other son of yours wasted your money on prostitution, and now he's come home, and you ordered the best calf to be killed for a feast. His father replied, My son, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we should be glad and celebrate. Your brother was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost and has now been found. Now, often when this parable is preached on, we really focus on that younger son, don't we? And I think we can all agree that that younger son has a lot of really rough edges. Douglas Adams says that when we focus so much on that younger son, we really miss out on the fracturedness of the whole family. So let's start at the beginning and reframe the story a little bit. Right at the beginning, the younger son says, give me my inheritance. You know what he's doing? He's saying, Dad, I'm done. You're dead. To me, you are dead. And since you're dead, and I'm never going to see you again or speak to you again, give me now what you have in the will for me. I don't want to wait till you're actually dead. Just give it to me now. Okay, now a lot of you out there are parents. How would you feel if one of your children came up to you and did that? Hey, guess what? I don't like you anymore. I'm never going to speak to you again. You're dead. You might as well be dead. Don't rewrite your will now that I've said that. Just give me what you owe me. Okay. I'd be annoyed. No, wait. Let's be honest. I'd be really angry. And I can guarantee you that I would not react the way that this dad does. He doesn't get mad. No. He says, okay, here's your inheritance. And then he goes a step further, which I'm not really sure is healthy or if he's being passive aggressive here. Because he doesn't give his younger son his inheritance. He divides up his entire property and gives both sons their inheritance. In effect, he's saying, fine. I'm dead to you. Might as well be dead. Have it all. I'm done. Leaves himself destitute because he now has nothing. Both of his sons have everything. But he is still alive. He's not dead. So while the younger son is off doing whatever it is the younger son is doing, the language that's used in Greek really isn't very clear what he's doing, the older son now has an inheritance to deal with as well. And he's in charge of all of the property and all of the servants and in charge of taking care of his dad. Because his dad's not dead, so he has to be responsible. He has to do what he's supposed to do and take care of it all. Do you think he might have been angry and resentful about that? He didn't ask for the inheritance, but he was given it. So, you know, at the end of the story, when the older son is mad at his dad and he's saying, you know, you never gave me even a goat so that I could have a party with my friends. Dad's like, um, no, wait, everything I have is yours. I did not give you a goat. You didn't give yourself a goat. This is not my problem. You made your choices. You chose what to do with the inheritance. You chose how to live your life. Not my problem. Does that seem like really healthy family dynamics to you? Doesn't really to me. So, I'm not sure that the dad really respects his older son and respects how his son has been living his life and using his inheritance. Because the reaction that the dad has when his younger son comes back really doesn't respect that, that older son as the head of household. The clothes, the sandals that he sends the servant to go get, yet those belong to the older son. And the ring, that ring. Adams points out that most likely that is the family signet ring. That is the ring that says who has control over the property. In effect, the dad may very well be taking everything away from the older son and giving it to his delinquent son. Makes you wonder what decisions the older son really has been making, because he's been in charge of it all. 
And I wonder what the older son would have thought if he'd seen that ring on his younger brother's finger. You know, we don't get to find out because when the older son comes home, the servant doesn't tell him that part. He just tells him about the party and about the guest of honor. And I gotta tell you, I think if I were the older son, I'd be angry too. He's been out working in the field and he comes home to a party happening in his house. Party in his house, being given by his servants, being financed 100% by him, but no one invited him. Who do you think didn't want him there? His dad or his brother? He wasn't invited. Doesn't sound like this party was about a family reunion. And you know, the story doesn't even have a happy ending. Jesus leaves us hanging. The two brothers don't reunite. No one makes amends with anyone. Jesus ends the parable with the dad and the older son fighting it out in the front yard while the younger son is inside having a party. We're left to figure out what comes next. We're left to figure out what we're supposed to learn from this story. And you know, there are a lot of different theories about what we're supposed to learn. Forgiveness, redemption, family unity. And I could, I could do a sermon on any of those. People have, as well as others. But I wonder if we've missed one of those lessons. Family messiness. The reality that there is no such thing as the perfect family. But don't we all know a family that wishes that we thought they were perfect? I know you know that family. That family, they're always so perfectly put together. They never disagree. They never raise their voices. Their kids are always perfectly behaved in public. And when you stop by their house unannounced, their house is clean. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't actually like those people. They make me really uncomfortable. <laughs> and I think it's because they project this image, this ideal that is impossible for any of us to live up to. And I find myself wondering if the older son had done just that that if after his younger brother took off to who knows where to do who knows what, that he decided to create the perfect parent story, whitewash out all of the younger brother's stuff, whitewash in the perfect responsible son who's properly managing all of his father's estate that he left him, leaving his father at home, taking care of him, not making his father lift a finger, because you notice when the younger brother comes back, dad's not out in the fields, dad's at home. So the younger brother has created this beautiful picture, perfect image for the community, for him and everyone there. And when his younger brother comes back, that kind of fractures that image a little bit. Shows the rough edges a little bit more. And I have to be honest, those rough edges actually bring me some comfort. See, I'm the younger sibling. I'm the younger sibling that grew up in the shadow of the responsible older sibling. The one who did what they were supposed to do and did well in school. And so I find comfort in being reminded that even those responsible people, even those people who look like they have it all together, you know, they've got their rough edges too. None of us is perfect. And maybe that's some of why Jesus tells grandparent stories. You know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were walking around painting a really perfect, pretty picture. They were the perfect, responsible, rule-following Jews. That perfect image that's hard to live up to. But Jesus' parables show their rough edges and remind people that, you know what? There is no way to be a perfect Jew. And so maybe those same things can be a comfort and a reminder to us today. There is no way for any of us to be the perfect Christian. 
There is no way for any of us to be the perfect parent, the perfect friend, the perfect spouse, the perfect person. And so maybe we shouldn't feel so bad when some of our rough edges show to the world. Please pray with me. God, we are grateful for the grandparent stories that Jesus tells. We are grateful that they allow us to follow him, to follow his example of life and to do the best that we can, because that is what you want from us. And that we always know that no matter what we do and no matter what rough edges are showing, that you love us always. In Christ's name, amen.